Good morning. If I could get the legislators to start heading up front and all of you, you can feel free to keep getting your coffee, getting your donuts. Um, let's just do so quietly and we'll get started here in another moment. Oh, good morning, welcome. I'm Ashley Fick. I'm a librarian here at Johnson County Library and I'm your moderator for the day. And I just wanna thank all of you for attending. Thank our legislators. It's a beautiful Saturday morning, so I know maybe um, there were some things that were tempting to pull you away, so thank you for being here. Um, and I wanted to start with a little bit of housekeeping. We invite every legislator with uh, constituents in Johnson County to participate at these. So if you saw someone was missing this year, um, let them know you wanna see them next year. This is our last one, unfortunately, so no more room. Um, but next year, there it will be plenty of room. Uh, we've got note cards in your chair. Please use those to submit your questions. If you could, just as a personal request, one question per note card, it makes it easier for me to keep track of what I've asked. Um, also, if you could write legibly and in the form of a question, that also helps me <laughs> ask your question. It's hard for me to ask it if I don't know what you're asking. Um, please don't shout out um, and no clapping and definitely no booing. All of these things help us keep things moving along, get to the most questions, and keep a tone of civility, which 93% of Americans agree that we have a civility problem in this country, and most Americans also agree that the path forward is mutual respect. So I want this program to be an example of that mutual respect and civility. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Each legislator has three minutes um, to share what they think is important in Topeka, their committee work, et cetera, and we're just gonna move down the line. So we'll start with Senator Corson first. Well, thanks so much, and thanks for being here today, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate these events and the talk and the chance to talk to people, and, and especially to hear your questions. Um, I always enjoy being here, in particular because my mom used to work here growing up. She was a, a information specialist at the library here, so I always appreciate being back here. Uh, so I'll tell you, kind of, I, you know, for me, the session has been a little bit different than my previous three. This is now my fourth year up in Topeka, and it's been a little bit different in the sense of it's just been a little bit less busy than my previous three were. My first three, it kind of felt like, especially at this time of year, we were really trying to push a lot of stuff through to the finish line. And this year, maybe it's because it's an election year, has just felt a little bit less of that than normal. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, we have done uh, some some good things. I'll kind of highlight a couple. We were able to reach a compromise between law enforcement and a lot of civil liberties groups on civil asset forfeiture reform, and so that actually passed both the House and the Senate unanimously. Uh, there was a, a very long and, and drawn out process of negotiation between those two organizations, and we were finally able to get them to a place where both felt like they could support it. So I think that's a real positive step forward for, for Kansans. So I, I would expect that, that Governor Kelly will be signing that bill into law here shortly. So that was a positive thing. Another positive is, and I hope that Representative Owsley will kind of share with you the details, but... Um, I really admire Representative Owsley for a lot of reasons, but one is that he's been probably the biggest leader in the legislature on child welfare issues. And one of the things he's worked on for a number of years is establishing an office of the child advocate. And that finally passed both the House and the Senate. And this has been something that predates even my election in 2020. It was something that I heard immediately uh, when I got elected the need for this office and folks had already been working on it. So it was a big accomplishment to finally get that across the finish line and Representative Owsley deserves as much credit for that as anybody else. There are some things that I am you know, concerned about. We, we did 
Uh, we, I say, I didn't vote for it, but the legislature did pass a ban on gender affirming care for minors that the governor vetoed yesterday. That will be uh, something that I would imagine that we'll consider for an override when we go back here at the end of the month. That concerns me. We also passed uh, two abortion uh, related bills, even though Johnson County and particularly my district voted overwhelmingly to protect a woman's right to choose. I'm concerned about that legislation. So as with anything, it's a mixed bag. And then finally, I think we need to hopefully in veto session, hopefully it doesn't uh, resort to a special session, but I do think we need to finally kind of land the plane on taxes this session. We've gone back and forth with different proposals, each of which have different strengths and weaknesses, and I think we can hopefully get a resolution here uh, in veto session. So again, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Representative Lindsey Vaughn. I represent uh, House District 22, which is actually this district here. So I'm really excited to be um, at the library this morning. This is my library, so um, especially grateful to be here with you all. Thank you for this opportunity. So I serve on uh, three committees. I serve on the House Water Committee, which is an issue that's important to me, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I also serve on House Health and Human Services, where we saw a lot of the anti-abortion and anti-LGBTQ bills come through, um, all of which I'm very opposed to and happy to talk more about. Um, the three that got vetoed that uh, Senator Corson was mentioning, one was the gender-affirming care ban for minors, so it completely bans access to puberty blockers, hormones, and surgery, albeit surgery is quite rare for minors anyway, um, but it completely blocks uh, and bans the option for minors to have access to that care in consultation with their parents and their healthcare providers. So that's something that's extremely concerning to me, and I hope that we are able to sustain the veto on that. Um, the other two were um, abortion bills that got vetoed. So one was an abortion survey. Um, basically, when a woman goes to seek an abortion, her healthcare provider would be required to ask her questions about why she is choosing to seek an abortion. So an invasion, in my mind, of her privacy and her right to access healthcare without uh, governmental intrusion. And then the third was creating additional criminal penalties for abortion coercion, which I think we all agree coercion is bad. Um, I think the concerns about this bill was that it was extremely broad and could um, potentially criminalize uh, private conversations uh, from a woman who is trying to seek access to these services and potentially stigmatizing abortion further. So I think um, you know those were three of the bills that we saw. Those were the three bills that got vetoed and that I think we will continue to battle towards the end of the month when we go back for veto session. Uh, as the senator also mentioned, I think the big focus for the session has been tax policy. That's why I think it's kind of gone a little bit slower because both the House and the Senate are really focused on trying to come up with tax relief for Kansans. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting dynamic because this has been more of a Senate and a House position versus a Republican and a Democratic position. So the Senate has a very strong position on their tax plan and the House has a very strong position on our tax plan, both of which have been bipartisan in each chamber. So it's kind of the House and the Senate battling out what policy we want to see move forward for tax relief in Kansas. And then... Um, I also serve on Judiciary Committee, which, as Ethan mentioned, I'm very excited that civil asset, asset forfeiture passed. That's um, it's huge progress for Kansans. And then um, quickly looping back to uh, Water Committee, the one thing I am really excited about this year, the governor has convened a... Um, a special advisor on water in Kansas and has uh, asked the Kansas Water Authority to move forward with a strategic plan for water quality and quantity in Kansas, which is a huge step forward, and I'm happy to talk more about that as well. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Senator Dinah Sykes, and I represent the 21st District, which um, is most of Lenexa, this part of Overland Park, so you are in my district as well as Representative Vaughn's. And then I have most of Miriam, a little bit of Shawnee, and a little bit of Olathe. 
thanks to redistricting, I've added several cities. Um, but I also have the privilege of serving as the Senate Democratic leader. Um, you know, Representative Juan and Senator Corson have done a really good job of highlighting kind of some of the big faces with tax. And uh, I do think we will come to some kind of agreement on tax. I do think um, the bill that passed in the wee hours of the morning on <laughs> Saturday morning um, it was probably a little too expensive, but I do know that there's already conversations trying to get the House and the Senate and the governor all on one page so that we can pass something. Um, something that I that these two have not spoken about is um, funding for our K-12 education, public schools. Um, I do serve on the conference committee. I'm ranking on education in the Senate. And unfortunately, this year again, um, our budget with um, when over half of our budget goes to public education, it was not in our um, budget that we passed. Um, the House normally pulls it out and then the Senate says, okay, we'll go <laughs> your way. And then we have bad policy uh, mixed with funding, which is not the way to pass good policy, I don't think. But um, in the wee hours of the morning on Saturday, we did kind of come to sort of an informal agreement and that conference We'll meet when we go back to um, session on probably the 25th or 26th. We're pro forma on the 25th, which means um, there's no business done on the floor of the House or the Senate, but some of those conference committees and um, the budget committees will be meeting. And um, so we will kick something out of there. Um, it, uh, it is a compromise. Um, it is fully funding our SPED this year, and it has the, with our, um, lawsuit several years ago and um, the courts put in that we had to do the CPI kind of adjustment that's also in there they did pull a couple of enhancements um, out and I don't love those but one was teacher professional um, development and some things like that but the full funding piece is in there and the biggest sticking point um, that was the bad policy on the house side was um, changing our special ed formula we were able to keep that piece out of this new bill. So our local um, school districts have been putting more and more in special education funding. Um, they're required by law to do 8%. Um, match, and the state is supposed to kick in 92%. We have not put in the state's obligation since I believe it was 2009. That's what I was thinking, 2009. Um, but so the school districts are putting, and I've got the stop sign, are putting um, about 30% back in there. So kind of instead of changing the formula, we have said, okay, we see you. Uh, we will have a spreadsheet to show all of the money that's going to schools, and then we will put the state's portion in one column, and then we will put the district's their portion in one column. And I'm gonna tell you in advance, my colleagues on the other side are gonna say, see, when you add this and this, we're well above the 100%, but that's not how it works because our constitution says the state is supposed to do 92%. So I will stop because I'm well over my time, but look forward to answering your questions. So now I'll pick up right there. Uh, the house position also had uh, clawback in it, like a non-severability, that if you didn't rewrite the SPED formula that said the state's now magically at 99%, even though we're not adding uh, any new dollars, we're, we're adding the one-year dollars of $77 million. And, uh, but, then, but then thereafter, we were at 99% and everything's done. Well, if that part of the bill got vetoed, then you didn't get any of the special education funding to any of the school districts. So that was another kind of heinous portion of the House bill that was removed in conference committee. Um, I, I appreciate the Senator's work on that. It, uh, I, I'm Jared Owsley. I serve on appropriations, uh, child welfare and foster care, and the K-12 budget in the House. So the the... I, I actually found myself quite busy to hear this last last couple of weeks of session, uh, not only with the K-12 budget conference committee, because, you know, there's only four of us on on that committee and there's a lot of moving parts. And sometimes there's a lot of, you know, hat, hat tricks or, you know, card tricks in there. And and, and so we, we we have a tendency to work together on that committee. So while we're on the floor you know, six members of, of the legislature downstairs in a different room, 
you know, arguing out half of the state budget and extremely important education policy. So we're trying to run back and forth from the third floor to the first floor and, and not miss a vote upstairs, but pay attention to what's going on downstairs. You know, there was an interesting conversation brought up during the K-12 or the education budget conference committee in that, uh, T uh, tier three in, in Kansas retirement employees retirement program has, has, I think been understandably and, and, and unarguable, not adequate. And th there are legislators that want to do something about it. And an attempt was made in the conference committee to go ahead and do that for certified teachers. Um, I personally didn't think it was fair. If you're going to do it for some, you need to do it for all. You know, you've got you've got uh, food workers, you've got bus drivers, you've got custodians that could all be in the same building working for the same USD for the same length of time. And if we all know it's broken, why wouldn't we fix it for all? So I'm glad the conversation came up in conference committee, and I and I look forward to having those conversations in a broader aspect where we can help more people. So. I'm trying to pay attention to that. I, I do sit on appropriations, and I have tried repeatedly to bring the K-12 budget back into the mega budget on appropriations, but I just can't get uh, enough support in there. So somewhere somebody's given the green light for our chair of K-12 to keep bundling policy with our budget and keep going through this conference committee late night, you know, writing the formula. Um, and then, as Ethan mentioned, the uh, Senator Corson, sorry, um, uh, it, it mentioned, you know, the child advocate uh, was also, you know, passed both chambers and we're waiting on a governor's signature. But then there were more. The, 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 there was more because then I, uh, Senator Corson also serves on judiciary where some child welfare uh, policy got dragged in at a last minute on the last day of committee meetings. And so I was trying to pay attention to that. So it's been a busy session, but I'm happy to be here this morning with y'all and look forward to the discussion. Okay. Just as a reminder, please don't clap or shout out, uh, not to call you out, but <laughs> several states uh, do not tax the retirement income of seniors. Eliminating tax on Social Security is fine, but many seniors have small pensions, etc. When will Kansas eliminate the income tax for income on seniors? I think that has overwhelmingly passed both chambers, and um, that is probably one piece I'm in the discussion that we all believe will pass uh, when we get back. And it's really the piece that's holding up everything is that income tax piece. But um, I think at the end of the day, and I don't control the calendar but or what comes to the floor, but I do think that both the Senate leadership and House leadership, if nothing else passes, Social Security will pass this session. question. So several states do not tax the retirement income of seniors. Eliminating the tax on Social Security is fine, but many seniors have small pensions, etc. When will Kansas eliminate income tax on income for seniors? And I think it's Social Security is where we are at right now, and that's really the first step. What are the sticking points between the House and the Senate on the tax reform? So uh, I can kind of talk about the House position with the tax policy than if one of the senators wants to take on the Senate position. So as Senator Sykes men mentioned, um, kind of the sticking point is the income tax piece of the tax bill. So, um, you know, there are things, I, I will say there are things that I like about both bills. There are things I don't like about both bills. Um, in the House position, the thing I don't like is that it does take it down from three brackets to two brackets. Um, but what it does is raise the standard deduction significantly so that people who have the lowest incomes are actually receiving the greatest percentage of the tax break. So um, I actually brought the runs, if anyone is interested, I can pull those out. So um, it takes it down to um, two brackets. The top bracket is, um, I wanna say it's 5.55%, which is a reduction from 5.71, Seven, and then the middle bracket is brought down from 5.25 to 515, and then again increases the standard deduction to 
uh, or sorry, the personal exemption to $18,200 for folks with no children, which means essentially those folks um, see a, a big reduction in the, the income tax that they're paying. So percentage wise, people at the very top receive about a 2.8% reduction in their income tax and people at the very bottom receive a 100% um, reduction in their income tax. So I think this tax structure is a lot more progressive than what the Senate is proposing because of the way that those percentages work out in the actual runs of the tax bill. Um, I think the Senate position, which um, they can talk more about, is that they would prefer to keep three brackets because that is overall a more progressive structure. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, you know, pros and cons of do we want uh, more relief for folks who have less money or do we want to keep a more progressive tax structure so that um, it's harder to um, try and achieve a flat tax in the future, which is what the Senate Republicans really want. So I think that's part of the battle. And then the other part is the total cost of the tax bill. So the Senate or the House position is more expensive than the Senate position, which um, I think we all want to avoid going back to the brown back tax years, which means having a sustainable income tax plan. And I think the governor's concern and the Senate's concern is that the House plan is a little bit too expensive. Um, and I do have that information as well, if anyone is interested, what the total cost to the state um, initially and then in the out years would be for the plan. So I think that'll be part of the compromise is how do we uh, reduce the overall cost of whatever tax plan we ultimately pass. Yeah, she did a great job. So the Senate, um, we want to keep that three tier structure. Um, and so the bill that kind of the House like sent back to committee, but we did that to them first. So, um, so it was, Increasing the standard deduction sub substantially where there is the personal exemption. So that's a difference. Um, and then ours, it was just taking off of that top bracket, which I know Senator Corson and I didn't let, like that. That's not like our preferred. We had an amendment that kind of took a shave off of all three brackets um, and that we couldn't get Republicans on board with that. But who knows what will happen when we go back. But um, one of the things is, and I think our structure, our thresholds are already, I think they're too low. So if you're um, single, you're paying the top bracket at 30000 And if you're married, filing jointly, it's at 60000 Like, I think that's the problem. And I know I would prefer to change those thresholds. That was told uh, to us that that was not the movement. But the plan that the House... Um, pass, they actually did change the thresholds. So now um, you're at that lower bracket from zero to, I think it's 43,000 if you're married and 20, maybe it's 46 and then 23 if you're single. Um, and my concern with this, I know Representative Owsley and I, we were back, we both served during the Brownback years where we were cutting budgets and I do not want to go back to that. <laughs> um, it was terrible. And so when I see the two tier and we, there are a lot of sweeteners for those people on the bottom so that they're not paying any income tax at all. But remembering those hard decisions that we had and saw what happened in history, those were the people that, um, the standard deduction, got changed, pulled back, under brown back, and it's the people who were trying to help the first that ended up paying for the tax plan in brown back. And that's why I'm opposed to the House plan because I really see, you know, repeating history. So, again, the governor had her kind of high mark about $425 um, million per year, and this one was about 50 million over that. It also doesn't include child care in it, which I have always been an advocate, and I think, you know, it just makes sense. If we're doing something for our seniors and our retired, what are we doing for our workforce? And so child care, I think, has to be another piece of that puzzle. Um, there is another bill out there that the House passed that does have that child care tax credit in it, but on the Senate side, Senate leadership had problems with it, and um, we had spent three days trying to get this to the floor, and they pulled it. And so I don't think that we're going to get that piece of the puzzle. So again, I hope we can have conversations and come to a compromise, and I think we will, but those are the biggest sticking points for me. 
So, so that was really well explained by both Senator Sykes and Representative Vaughn. You know, for me, I've been sort of carrying around everywhere I go this copy of uh, from the division and budget of what they project that the current tax bill would do to our long term budget. And so I'll just kind of go into the weeds and give you a little more color. I mean, I think there are real strengths of what the House passed. I think there are real strengths of what the Senate passed. But for me, I think I just cannot support putting my district back in position where we were under Governor Brown back. Because the first thing that will be cut when funds get tight is schools. And the second thing that will be cut is roads and infrastructure. And the third thing that will be cut will be basic services. And so... What this projects is that by fiscal year 2029, we'd be taking in $477 million less than we're projected to be spending. Okay, so that was probably at a high level my biggest problem with the House plan. Um, you know, we would be going back to a position where right now we have a really healthy budget surplus. We would be then in a negative ending balance of almost $400 million. And so I just think we need to be able to pass a plan that is sustainable year over year and certainly putting us in a position where we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars more every fiscal year than we're taking in. That's just not going to be sustainable and that's going to lead to really damaging cuts. So I think there were strengths of both, both of the plans, but I, overall, I just think that we need to get to a position where we can, whatever we pass can be sustained in future years. So, I mean, Governor Kelly has is, is basically kind of moved a lot on this. I mean, initially, her view was $400 million a year in lost revenues. We, uh, well, yeah, it was three fifty, dollars and then she was willing to go to four hundred. dollars and then the Senate bill that we passed that I supported, Senator Sykes supported, was about $425 million. So I think she has been really generous. But I would just urge some caution on this because our budget surplus looks relatively large now. It's about $2.5 billion. But $1 billion of that is one-time federal funds. So once we spend those once we once those monies are gone, there's no tax revenues that are coming back in to fill that. Um, we're going to get a new consensus revenue estimate this coming Friday. It's likely going to be for the first time since COVID. Our as our projections are going to go down, so that deficit number that I mentioned is going to get bigger and bigger. So. Um, Again, I think there's a lot that both the House and Senate agree on, particularly around property tax, around Social Security, around standard deduction. But we just need to be able to put this in a position where we're not in future years either going into the red or having to claw back some of the benefits that we're providing to folks. So so not to belabor it, but I, I feel like I need to chime in because... Part of, part of this gives me hope and that we're close to an agreement and we got bipartisan support and we've got the governor and the division of budget chiming in on it. And if, if anything, this governor has been fiscally responsible along with her budget director, and I'm going to take them at their word for what's best for the state financially, you know, moving ahead. But I, I will remind folks also, um, this is, this is part of the frustration of this time of the year and that we started, I think second order of business was a tax package, you know, uh, of the session. So we were discussing this back in January. And now here we are in wee hours of the morning, you know, in, in some of the final days of, of session finally coming together. So I, I hope when we get back, you know, we're close enough now that we can, you know, continue discussions if need be. Um, so on this one, all I've been telling folks is just stay tuned. But I feel like everybody's at the table and everybody's working. So just really quickly, I'm going to give a minute for this one. Um, with the different agendas between the House and the Senate, how likely is it to bring about another last-minute bill passage? I think with the conversations that are going on now um, with kind of all parties, the House, the Senate, and the governor's office, I do believe that we will get there. And so and kind of on a note on that, we were supposed to um, – 
go. So the 25th and 26th were going to be those working days for committees. And then the, all of the legislature was coming back on the 29th to pass bills. And they changed that schedule kind of at the last minute. So the 25th will be a working day. The 26th, we will be on a floor. And the House has this ridiculous schedule that the Senate doesn't have yet. But they're going to be working um, all Friday, all Saturday, off on Sunday, working Monday, and then we're going to have signy die on Tuesday. So we've got five days to do this, but I think the conversations happening now will help that. What would it take to raise the state minimum wage? Is minimum wage currently being discussed? I, I could talk about that because I brought forth a bill every year that I've been in the Senate to raise the minimum wage. Uh, it has never gotten a hearing. Uh, kind of what I propose, which I think makes the most sense, is to stair step it. So we would get to $16 an hour over a period of years. I have um, you know, been frustrated that we haven't had that, been able to even have a hearing on it or have that conversation. Um, I'm going to continue to bring that forward because I do think it's a real issue that our state needs to grapple with. Um, one of the good things about the, the budget is that now the governor and it has been agreed to that the state minimum wage for state employees is $15. So that is is progress on that area. And I think the hope is that you know, once wages get raised in one sector, hopefully the private sector will follow just because they will need to compete for workers. So that's encouraging that our state employees are now getting at least $15 an hour. But it has been kind of a source of continuing frustration for me that I brought forward this legislation every year and it's just sat in the Senate Commerce Committee and it hasn't been able to get a hearing. Because um, I think, you know, if COVID showed us anything, it's the work that these people do, you know, stocking shelves, making sure that our kids are getting the childcare that they need, that our, our shelves are stocked, that, you know, our groceries are there. You know, they provide a really important function to all of us. And, and I think they're deserving of, of a better wage. And so I'm going to continue to work to make that happen, even though it has been a little bit of a, a frustrating road. Where do you stand on transgender health care? And then there's also a th uh, note thanking you for your presence today. I can get started on this one. Um, so, I mean, LGBTQ rights and uh, trans rights are really important to me personally. Um, as someone who has a trans loved one in their life, um, I know how important it is to have access to this health care. It's a decision that a patient is making in conversation with their parent and with their doctor, and I view it very similarly um, to the way that I view abortion health care. These are decisions that are important and crucial to uh, a trans youth's um, happiness in their ability to live their authentic lives, and you know the government should not be telling them what to do. Um, you know, for folks who may not uh, know a lot about this issue, oftentimes uh, trans youth will um, start out by talking with a therapist or mental health care provider. Um, they often start in therapy and then will begin conversations with their health care provider about puberty blockers. You know, how can they slow down puberty while they make decisions about, um, you know, how they want um, you know, to present their authentic selves moving forward um, in conversation with their doctor, their therapist, and their parents. And, and after that, they will um, often begin potentially um, hormones, and then um, they may eventually pers pursue surgery, but that is almost always after a youth is 18 and can make those decisions um, as an adult. So I think they're this is a very complicated and nuanced and personal decision that's being made by children and their families and their and their doctors. Um, gender affirming care is overwhelmingly supported by all of the major medical associations in the United States as evidence based care, as necessary care, um, and as life as life saving care. So we know this is really important. I think there um, are efforts on the far right to try and politicize this issue that impacts. Um, you know, a small percentage of folks, like I said, who are, are just trying to be their authentic selves. And I think that is, I mean, it's discriminatory. And I think, um, I mean, it's, it's really sad to me because it, 
Um, I have seen how this negatively impacts the mental health of folks who aren't able to access the care and be their authentic selves and, and for the state to be criminalizing them in this way. And that's really disheartening to me and I'm really sad that the legislature is focusing on this issue. And I know all of us will keep fighting for the rights of trans folks and for LGBTQ folks. Um, and, and that's something that I'm committed to as well. So that's, that's kind of my stance on that and um, something that I'm committed to keep fighting for. I think and Lindsay did a great job of that. And I think it has gotten politicized in Topeka and it's very unfortunate. Um, it has consequences with our workforce, um, with families, whether they want to put down their roots in Kansas. Um, and, you know, we need to be loving and accepting and show people that we care about them. And statistics show that with gender affirming care, whether it's counseling, having those conversations, but access reduces suicide by 73%. And um, unfortunately, I think some of our colleagues on the other side um, do not want to have the conversation. They do not want to have conversations with doctors or healthcare providers, mental health, about how this actually is affecting youth. And um, I've heard my colleagues on the Senate floor saying, well, people just go in and change their gender like they change their nail polish. And I'm like, that's not true. So um, we, I know all of us up here will continue to fight for that because uh, I just want to say to our trans community and families that you are welcome in this state and there are people who are fighting for you and you have a place here. So thank you. Briefly, I, the other thing that I forgot to mention um, that really frustrates me, access to uh, puberty blockers and hormones is used overwhelmingly by um, cisgender folks uh, or, or used at rates significantly higher by cisgender folks than it is by transgender folks. So, um, you know, those types of things can be used for uh, precocious puberty, for, um, you know, other, other health-related matters that cisgender folks access all the time, and this is specifically banning it for transgender children. So in that way, it is overtly discriminatory. Um, but I do think for people who don't necessarily know about this issue, it's important to know that these therapies are used all the time for people, for, for young folks and people all over the US, and this is only banning it for transgender, ch transgender kids. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I will guess, I guess I'll just make a confession here today, which is that I barely passed 10th grade biology. So the idea that myself or other Kansas state legislators should be making these decisions for what are really difficult decisions for parents in consultation with their child and their medical providers. I mean, we've got two young boys. I know that if we were going through a situation, my wife and I would want to be able to make decisions in consultation again with our child and we'd wanna be getting the best, most expert medical care, I really wouldn't need to be seeking out the thoughts of what um, my colleagues in the legislature might think about what sort of health care that my child uh, should be getting. And so that's always how I've approached these issues. I mean, I've always voted on the side of equality across the board. Um, but again, I just think these are deeply personal, private decisions that families need to make. And, you know, I actually, we got a card sent to our office from a family in Olathe um, who has a, um, a, a daughter who is um, going through gender affirming care. And, and the card just said that, you know, basically that our family has benefited from this kind of care. And so I struck up kind of an email correspondence with the father. And I mean, he said, you know, look, we sent that card because we were hopeful that people in the legislature would understand that we're just like any other family. And we're going through a situation. We love our daughter just like everybody loves their own children. We want to make sure that we're doing the best thing for her mental health, for her health care. We're trying to get the best care that we can. And so, again, it just seems ridiculous to me that the Kansas legislature feels the need to insert themselves into these decisions that really, I think, you know, Kansas families aren't coming to me and saying, hey, Ethan, I really need help. Can you help us make this decision for our families? I mean, families are making the decisions. They're perfectly capable of doing that, and they're the best people to do that. So I, I think the question was, you know, where do you stand on it? And I, I'll just say that, you know, Wednesday morning, I was at the Johnson County Commission on Aging update, and, you know, we discussed things there, and workforce came up. Uh, Friday morning, I was with the uh, Children's Alliance giving an update to our foster care providers. Workforce came up there. The senator raises a point. This does hinder our, our 
our ability to have a healthy workforce, not only does it encourage out migration of those that believe in equality, but then I'm pretty sure this bill went as far as to say that if I, as a legislator, being a state employee, right, uh, if I use the proper pronouns of, of a child, then that would be a criminal act. Uh, and, and I guess the, uh, where I stand, I just wanted to make it a point that Thursday night I, I had the, uh, the honor of co-hosting an event for Equality Kansas where we were able to raise some funds and help these people fight back a little bit. Please explain the significance of the child advocate. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Please, please explain the significance of the child advocate. Uh, six years worth of work, six years worth of uh, fine tuning of input from stakeholders all around from, again, our, our child welfare providers to our legal community, uh, our foster parents, our adoptive parents, our biological parents, folks that have you know, come into contact with our child welfare system in the state of Kansas one point in time or another. The significance, I think, is that this time it's going into statute, not in an executive order. I think three years ago when the House and Senate could not come to an agreement, and it was about this time of the year, uh, we, we walked away from a conference committee where the House just said no go. The Senate had had a position and the House completely disagreed with it, and we held strong. The The governor then took actions into her own hand, recognizing the need for the child advocate and established it by executive order. The problem with that is the separation of powers in that it doesn't grant the office quite the, the authority or the ability to fully conduct the duties of the office. So while it's been up and operational and been given reports to the to the committees in, in there, and I will say that I personally, if, if you Google Jared Owsley, you're gonna come up with a headline somewhere for child welfare in the state of Kansas. And because of that ability, because of my position as ranking member for eight years and serving on the interim committees, I get calls from all over the state of people that, can you help me? You know, I'm, I'm dealing with this contractor, I'm dealing with this department, and, and I need, and, and oftentimes, you know, I can't do much. Uh, I'm, I'm one representative. Uh, representatives need 62 friends to do anything, right? 63 is the magic number. So the, the, see, seeing that it's working as an executive order, I think, put punctuation behind it that we need to get it in statute. And, uh, and we were finally able to put some of our politicized differences uh, aside and get it done. So I, I think it'll be tremendously significant, though I don't think we as a general public will see much of a change going from executive order to statute, um, but I'm, I'm happy to see it do so. I hope, that, I hope that answered the question. New Century Airport is an economic generator for Johnson County. Senate Bill 172 would negatively affect some development at New Century. How likely is this or similar legislation to be an ongoing issue? So, um, I mean, I think this is bad policy and... Um, I actually sat in on Fed and State when they were trying to get the Senate version of, um, I think it was 172, and it didn't even make it out of committee because we did see this as unconstitutional and some other pieces like that. It did get bundled. Um, the House version of the foreign adversary bill got bundled in with some other bills. It was a government competition and uh, veterans tax, property tax relief. Anyway, the House actually killed the bill and sent it back to conference. So I do think um, probably for this session, we're okay, but our Attorney General, um, this is his brainchild, and so I think it will continue to come up. But it was good to see strong um, bipartisan support um, that this is going too far. We do want safety. We do want to make sure our military facilities are safe. But um, this was a terrible bill and just 
overstepped the authority. And um, like at one point on the Senate bill, if you are selling land to anyone who had any foreign, if it was over three acres, you had to go before a board of three people to decide whether or not you could sell your land. And so it's unconstitutional. And thankfully, um, some prevailing (laughs) minds came together and we were able to stop it. But um, I think that it will be a continued um, conversation in years to come. So elections have consequences and um, the entire legislature is up for re-election in November. If the Kansas City Chiefs cross state line to Kansas, what's the probability of legislative support? I mean, look, I, I think I think it's really interesting. I think it depends, you know, exactly the context of, of what that would look like. I mean, one of the challenges that I think Missouri ran into is, uh, or, yeah, I guess Jackson County, is you had one county that was, you know, solely paying that tax when there was a lot of other counties that obviously people are going to Chiefs games, including from Kansas, but you've also got Clay County and other counties. So I, I think it would just depend on kind of what the – the whole package looked like and the totality of it. But I mean, I think that there would be, I think it would be at least worth having those conversations about what it could look like. But I think it would be a question of kind of how is the burden shared across the state um, and, and what would the dollar figure look like? But I think it's, it's again worth at least looking at. So I I will agree with the senator in that uh, on the Appropriations Committee, we had conversations about $28 million coming to the Kansas City area to help with KC26, right, when the World Cup is coming. So they're asking for some extra money, you know, for transportation services, security services. Um, And I thought, you know, security services is we're having these conversations shortly after the Super Bowl parade that people would just be, okay, yes, we need to make this investment. You know, this is a, a, an international event and it's going to bring all sorts of attention to Kansas and Kansas city area. And it will benefit, you know, half the state, you know, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and those conversations, well, what's in it for the rest of the state. So I, I, I think it would depend a lot what the package looks like because folks in the legislature are not exactly interested in, financially benefiting one area of the state. Were there any anti-voting bills this session and how did you vote? Please explain. Um, I may pass the buck on this one. There were a lot and a lot of them got bundled. I think we have... um, thankfully killed a lot of them. The one that we killed on the House side was eliminating the three-day grace period, which is something that Republicans keep trying to do. Um, But there was bipartisan support to kill it, so not all Republicans. There's there's an an acknowledgement that um, that is important for, um, you know, ballots that are postmarked by election day to be able to received by the election office in that three-day period and still be counted. Um, You know, so there was an effort to do that this year. Um, There was an effort to eliminate voting on Saturdays, which, I mean, there was conversation about that because it has become a really popular day, uh, This, excuse me, the Saturday before the election. So it'd be early voting the Saturday before the election. And, you know, some folks are like, well, you know, it's getting so overwhelming and then we have to prepare for the election on Tuesday. So, you know, we want to limit um, Saturday voting. Generally, I don't support any limiting of voting. And so, um, you know, all those types of bills I voted against um, those were the two I remember off the top of my head. Were there, do you guys remember any other anti-voting efforts? There's so there, there was this one bill that did unfortunately pass that dealt with, um, the way that, uh, we could accept and use federal funds, uh, to help assist our elections. And it basically prohibited Kansas from receiving federal funds. And it was really made no sense because all we're doing is just reducing the funds that we have to put on really quality, safe, secure elections. I mean, there's no real benefit to it other than that. And of course, the legislature is not going to backfill the money that would normally be going to these counties. 
So all we're doing is just giving counties less funds to put on their elections. So it made no sense. It, uh, you know, my kind of life philosophy is if Mike Thompson's for it, I'm against it. And so uh, it's it just another bill that, that Mike brought forward that was brought to us by this out-of-state conspiracy theory group uh, about somehow this federal money that was problematic. It also may throw us out of compliance with various federal statutes like the Help America Votes Act. So it's, again, probably something we'll be in court over. Saving the three-day grace period was a really big victory. So I appreciate everybody who stood up against that. Um, we had a lot of rural Republicans who, because of mail service in their area, really were worried about that and were some of some of the uh, our kind of maybe unlikely allies on that. I'll just tell you a quick anecdote about how ridiculous this three-day grace period bill. Do I have like a... 30 seconds. So this bill was so poorly drafted that um, what it said was you can't vote on the Monday before a Tuesday election unless you go in to your county election office and the uh, election person decides that you get to vote. And so it's like, I mean, this is, it's sort of like you can't be like that's being half pregnant. You either, voting is either open to all eligible voters or it's not. Right, and we tried to explain that to Mike, and it seemed like he wasn't really tracking on that. But, you know, I mean, just this idea that you could go into a, a voting location and you could say, "Hey, I have to, I have to work tomorrow on Tuesday, and so I can't vote in the election." It would just be up to that election official whether they thought that was an acceptable excuse or not. So maybe in Wyandotte County that excuse works, and then maybe in Allen County that excuse doesn't work. So then you've got just sort of these inequities between counties. I mean, maybe a county person says, well, I don't really like redheads, and so I'm not going to accept any excuses from redheads. I mean, the bill is so poorly drafted, it's kind of embarrassing what happens at the end of sessions when we try to jam through these really bad laws. But it didn't pass. I hope, think we've killed it for this session. But that three-day grace period continues to be kind of a boogeyman for uh, some of our more extreme colleagues. Um, the one other briefly that I wanted to mention, I remembered. So um, if you remember a couple years ago, which I know the League of Women Voters probably does, um, the Attorney General also led a bill that makes it illegal to impersonate an election worker, which has basically halted voter registration efforts for advocacy groups like the League of Women Voters and Loud Light across the state. Um, it's clearly unconstitutional, um, but right now that's being battled out in the courts. And so um, I believe it was the AG's office and some other folks this year who came back and said, well, we didn't really like mean that. So we're going to try and like, you know, make this bill um, clearer to, you know, so it's not quite as broad. And um, uh, that, I think, has gotten bundled up with other things and generally... Um, they were trying to clarify things and it really didn't do a very good job and was still overly broad and they're just trying to basically cover their, um, you know, mistakes because it's because of what they have done is really unconstitutional. So I think that's an ongoing conversation um, and I don't think that any, I, some of this gets, um, they get bundled and they get voted on late at night and um, so I have to, I have to go back and see where that landed but I, that piece is still being debated too because of the fallout of that, that previous bill and the ongoing lawsuit. And I would say anyone who has concerns, our Secretary of State, who is a Republican, says we have safe and secure elections, and they are always very cautious. Um, I care about the three-day grace period, so I have kids. Both of them are out of state in college, and they re request that advance ballot like before the deadline, and it gets sent from the Johnson County Election Office like the de first day. And um, one of my sons, it took over two weeks to get it. The very day he received it, he went, filled it out, put his stamp, put it back in the mail. It came the day after the election. And so I was debating this with Senator Thompson on the floor. And he was like, well, he should have done a better job. I'm like, he had nothing. The only thing, I could have spent a $500 to get him a flight <laughs> to come and vote on election day. So I just want to reiterate, our Secretary of State says we have fair and safe elections. And so this rhetoric that we have fraud is untrue. And everything, they are trying to pick who can vote and win and make it harder. The 
Does the excessive amount of money earmarked for special education take away from other students? Um, the amount of money earmarked for special education is one fifth of the state's obligation to get us to our statutory obligation. It takes nothing away from other students. As a matter of fact, by not funding special education, we end up taken from the general education fund, which in turn not only harms our kids with IEPs, but every student in the classroom. I think I can leave it that simple. A House member was recently arrested with multiple charges, including possession of a firearm while under the influence. There were two DUIs in 2020 and another in 2021. Since these continue to occur, what more should leadership do to stop this dangerous behavior? I think we all have to make decisions for what we do. And I will say there is a lot of alcohol and um, things that we get to participate in um, if you so choose, but we are all adults and I think we have to show responsibility and show our youth and our people who elect us that we can handle that. I will say it is a stressful job and there are times that when you are working for 24 hours straight, um, but I think each of us as legislators, we can demand a better schedule. We can choose to 63, 21 to say, no, we don't want to do this. We're going to adjourn and we're going to come back tomorrow. And so, um, again, I think we all have opportunities to make bad decisions, but I think it's on each and every one of us to um, show leadership in that. So again, I'm not privy to leadership discussions, but I can say the most recent DUI in the House, the legislator stepped down from a leadership position on our Judiciary Committee. They were vice chair and are no longer. And whether or not leadership had something to do with that, I'm not sure, because members of the legislature are duly elected by their district. So the leadership can strip committee positions, they can, you know, strip committees altogether, um, but there's only so much that they can do constitutionally, so. Would quote unquote bad apples in our police force be immune, qualified immunity, from civil and criminal liability for their actions? You know, I mean, I think the answer for me is no. Um, and, you know, this is an issue we've kind of, you know, gotten around the edges of looking at either in the Senate Judiciary Committee or in the Joint Committee on Corrections and Juvenile Justice, of which I'm also a member. Um, but, I mean, I think the short answer is, is no. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I... I would say no on that also. It's not an issue that we've tackled in the House Judiciary recently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think um, everyone should be um, subject to the law and that, that uh, bad apples, especially in law enforcement and in and, um, and, and, um, positions where folks have power and access to um, uh, and, and use that power in our society, I, I don't think that they should be immune from, from those things. I would agree to the, uh, what both my colleagues have said. And also, I think uh, making sure that if it is a police officer or someone who is leaving a position, that as they're applying to other positions, that that history is available. Because I think that's probably one of the biggest pieces. Because we can, they can leave Overland Park, but then they can go to Garden City, and they still have that issue. So I think that's that transparency there is something that we probably should look at. All right, at the end of time. So I want to thank all of you for being here on your Saturday morning, and especially thank you to our legislators for taking time out of their Saturday morning to be with their families. If We did not quite get to all the questions, so if you want to follow up, we've got a sheet with all of their contact information. Um, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and then thank you. I'll ho I hope to see you next year.